Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of More Perfect Marketing. It's David Baer here, and today we're going to be talking about pricing. Specifically, we're going to talk about how do you determine what to charge, and if you're going to make a change or a shift in what you're charging, how do you actually do that? Joining me for this conversation is a guy who goes by the name the Price Whisperer, and that possibly is because his real name, <laughs> Herr Schofers, is a little hard to pronounce. In fact, I asked him how to pronounce it before we started the uh, the conversation, and he gave me the 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 real original pronunciation, which he'll he'll share with you in a moment. And oh. and I said, no, I'm I, I think I'm going to go with the anglicized version of it. So, um, before we get into our conversation, I, I, you know, we do a, a great deal of uh, talking about how do you strategically approach the marketing of your business? How do you think beyond how am I going to get new customers? How am I going to keep those customers? How am I going to sell them something else? And one of these triggers, one of these areas that we don't lean on enough is, in fact, pricing. And the fact is that many businesses out there don't have a reason or rationale behind the pricing that they choose. We'll talk a little bit about what some of those mistakes are that uh, are very, very common among businesses when they set their pricing. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get into how to make some changes around that. So, Pear, welcome to the show. Uh, David, it's a pleasure to be on the show, and I, I hope we... Um... I hope we're going to um, entertain and enlighten the audience. Well, I, I hope I hope that we can entertain them. I know that we always enlighten them. Um, and may, maybe for some entertainment purposes, um, we should attempt to pronounce your last name and then get into our pricing discussion. So I said chauffeurs because you you uh, uh, find that acceptable among us Americans. But how would it uh, be pronounced traditionally? Well, um, in in my native Swedish, uh, it would be pronounced like this, Hörfors. Very different. Yes. Very, very different. And um, and I've I've had the uh, I actually left Sweden in the mid nineteen eighties. So um, so I I I, I lived more more of my life outside Sweden than than in Sweden. So, um, I have um, uh, I. I've heard all different pronunciations and all different spellings of my name. And uh, one reason why I adopted this moniker, the price whisper, you know, mm -hmm. um, and um, some people are really picky about what, uh, what they're being called, but um, I'm like a dog, you know, you call me anything and I'll run for the treat, you know? So, <laughs> well, especially when it comes to talking about pricing and, and so let's, let, we should, we should get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, on on this show before we probably have touched on um, challenges around pricing opportunities around pricing um you know uh ideas about whether it's a good or a bad idea to discount or things like that we happen to be recording this uh right before one of the biggest discounting days of the year it's uh the week of black friday right now when we're recording and you know i just sent out an email to to my list saying don't do it and here's why and then and a whole bunch of rationale um but you know, we we can go in a bunch of different directions here. I I wonder if we can start with talking a little bit about some of the mistakes, discounting among them, that you see regularly when it comes to how businesses approach pricing. Well, when it, when when we talk about discounting and specifically Black Friday discount, um, I want the audience to be aware that a lot of those people who gave give you great discount on Black Friday, they increased their prices two weeks ago. Right. Yeah. So, um, so um, it it may or may not be the great deal that 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 the audience think it is when when buying on on Black Friday. So, um, but um, there are many mistakes when it comes to pricing. Um, but I sort of summarized them into three big mistakes. Okay. And and the first big mistake is to is to try to get hold of, of a competitor's prices. Uh, 
mm -hmm. and then price the same, right? Now, um, <clears throat> if, if you're in, in B2C, um, you may be able to get competitors' prices on websites or on resellers and stuff like that. But you still don't know what kind of deals a company makes or what kind of um, specials they make or if they change prices eight times a day or if uh, if the prices are geotagged so you different areas see different prices or or if you um, if you come back you know within a couple of hours you see a different price again you know sure so um, so uh, and if you're in B2B, yes, in some cases, you may also have the same issue with with finding prices if if your competitors have it on the website. Uh, if they don't have it on the website, it's almost impossible to know what the competitors charging. Um, you can ask joint customers and they're gonna lie, right? They're not gonna <laughs> tell right. they're not gonna tell you. Uh, who who the who asking that uh, in fact your competitor is twenty percent more expensive than you? They're going to tell you they um, that you are in fact more expensive than them because they want a better price, right? Sure. So um, so pricing to a competitor is is a big mistake because um, um, because first of all the chances that you can actually obtain the price that is anywhere near close to reality is 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 very slim and if you do um it it is often the first step into the um commoditization death spiral right mm. because you price the same then suddenly you have the same feature functions benefits and then you start marketing the same and when you're a commodity Lowest price wins. You, if your commodity, you, your company, whatever service, whatever product you have is perceived as being identical to your competitors. And, and if you're identical to your competitors, the lowest price wins. And that leads to um, lesser resource to develop new stuff, lesser resource to market. Um, and and so, so then you start falling behind, you know, and, and, and you have to lower the price even more to get the business. And and uh, it, no, you don't want to be in the uh, in the in that death spiral because in the end, um, your company or your product or services end up either on life support or simply dead. You know, sure. In in, in fact, it's it's for us as business leaders, um, our shorter is to decommoditize ourselves, right? And what I mean with that is to understand what specific values, what specific features, functions, benefits, and it it may not be the product itself. It may not be the service itself. It may be stuff around it that, um, that you can deliver to your customers so you get pricing power and can charge higher prices and at the same time see higher sales volume. So that's the first mistake. It was a long answer, you know. Well, and, and and I like that. And I'm gonna I'm, before we move on to the other two uh, mm. mistakes, um, and and I, I I know where we're going with those. I, I want to talk about this commoditization issue for a moment because we see this in the marketing industry. But but as as you and I were talking uh, before we hit record, um, it, it exists in other industries. Financial uh, advisors are highly commoditized as well. Yes unless they position themselves differently. One of the things that we are seeing with uh, professional marketing um, uh, agencies and, and service providers is that as uh, the world opened up as a result of COVID, the access to people across the globe opened up mm -hmm. and suddenly you have people who have skill sets in countries where it's not as expensive to live. Philippines, yeah. Pakistan, India are good examples. Nigeria, able to connect with and deliver services mm -hmm. to you know a business in North America. Well, yeah. suddenly, if you're a search engine optimization or a Facebook ads you know business, well, you've become a commodity. And so yeah. your, your point is very well taken. And and figuring out how do you reposition yourself so that the people you're selling to are interested in what you have to offer rather than, you know, this person's charging X and the other person's charging Y. 
Exactly, and 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 that differentiation is the is is the basis for pricing power. Uh, the term pricing power, by the way, uh, was coined by Warren Buffett. Okay, and 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 what he said was that his main criterion for um, making investments was whether a company has pricing power or not, and then he continued to um, to to define what pricing power means, and he said. Pricing power is the ability to increase prices without losing sales volume, right? Mm, okay. And 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 you can only do that by by differentiation. So this is this is a continuation of his um, moat concept. How how can we uh, protect ourselves from any sort of competition? And pricing power is is one of those elements in 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 his analysis of a business. Is is what yes. you're saying? Okay. Yeah. So uh, there, there were two other things, and I, I want to make sure that we have a chance to touch on those. And I'm guessing that one of them has to do with um, a business is pricing based on what their expenses are, what their costs are, yeah. and and they're they're simply marking it up or picking a random percentage or something like that. Yeah, cost plus, um, uh, very common. The um, <clears throat> the the funny thing is that the the um, there's sort of rules of thumb um, on on um, in, in, uh, that are different in different industries. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at um, um, <laughs> rules, uh, look at the the sort of old school manufacturing industry. They 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 calculate the manufacturing cost and then they add another thirty five percent or add another fifty percent. Mm -hmm. This is very common. I mean, I <clears throat> I had conversations with. Um, this is a few years ago, and this was a, I think at the time it was the world's fifth or fourth largest company, right? And uh, we talked to them in in the division selling uh, home appliances. And, and they said, well, in our company, uh, we are cost plus, <laughs> mm. you know, and it was what a $50 billion company, yep. you know? And 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 it's a it's a it's a guaranteed way of make you know leaving money on the table, right? And 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 like I said, different industries have different uh, rules of thumb. Retail, they typically double the the cost, so the markup is a hundred percent. In in some tech industries, it's it's five times cost or ten times cost, and. Uh, I happen to be a, a little bit in in the in the, you know involved or have been involved in the audiophile industry, mm -hmm. and um and 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 seen examples of of markups being you know fifty times cost right. So um and 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 um, and and you know it's it's. You, cost is important because you don't want to sell below cost, but cost right. should not be the basis for your price, right? Now, let me tell you a, a little thought about cost plus right? sure. that I think um, audi the audience that that um, use this kind of cost uh, plus pricing should really think about. Let's say that you let's say that you have a product. That cost you fifty bucks either to manufacture or to import from uh, from uh, China or whatever. It's fifty bucks, right? And um, for whatever reason, you you decide on the cost plus margin of a hundred percent. So you double the double the mar the fifty plus, and mm -hmm. your price is going to be a hundred, right? Um, now then, say that you for manage to reduce your co cost with ten bucks, so. Um, in the first case, your dollar margin is fifty dollars. Now, if you reduce cost for this product but to, to forty dollars, you still use the same margin, and your price is going to be eighty bucks, right? You just left twenty bucks on the table. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 this happens millions of times every day. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and it adds up. <laughs> it adds up, yeah. yeah. So um, another thing to think about um, when when we talk about cost plus and the, and there's 
um, there's something called price walls. Mm -hmm. And price walls are psychological price points where small price changes generates very significant change in sales volume. And let me uh, first let me illustrate that with with, with um, uh, you know a story. Uh, just before the pandemic here, I spent some time with one of the VPs of one of the major computer companies. They have a cost plus model as well. And um, the guy said that they took this one computer model, they started to inch up the price a dollar at a time, and they could go up seventeen dollars without any change in volume whatsoever. But if they went up $18, sales just fell through the floor. So they had found one of these price walls, but it also meant that they had been leaving $17 on the table. For however long they were charging that original price. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, when you're selling 10,000 of this commoditized product every day, it makes a difference. True. Now, so how many times do I get shivers you know when i see people with cost plus pricing because many times we can we 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 kind of intuitively know where those price walls are i can measure how big they are mm -hmm. but i know where they typically are and it's the you know it's the 50 bucks it's the 100 bucks it's the 500 bucks you know those sort of even numbers you know sure and and here i am uh, i'm looking at um you know uh, say a, a dining table right at a, a at a store and it's a thousand three dollars <laughs> you know <laughs> because it's cost plus sure right it's crazy yeah you know so so <laughs> cost plus is not the way to do it and and the third one of course is just pulling uh, pricing pricing out of a hat mm -hmm. guessing and um I have another story on that. The the um, a company we worked with um, and the the uh, their, their SaaS company, and and the CEO told me that I decided that the price is going to be one hundred sixty five dollars a user a month, and then he continued, but I don't know if that's the right price. Maybe it should have been ninety nine. Maybe it should have been two hundred fifty, but one hundred sixty five just felt right. Is that the right price? Probably not. <laughs> you know, the, we we started pricing in our business in that fashion, and it and it was a combination of for, so so our business at the time was um, doing consulting work with uh, businesses around marketing strategy. Yeah, and our approach this was a new offer, and we had been a marketing service provider and chose to reposition ourselves. And so mm -hmm. we really didn't have a sense of where we needed to price. So we priced at a certain price, and I can't remember uh, what, what the original price was, but I think it was um, something between eight, it was probably eight, eight and $10,000 uh, for a clearly defined engagement with a specific outcome. Mm -hmm. And we sold a few at that price and very quickly realized that we were not charging enough. Mm -hmm. Based on A, who was saying yes, and B, who we thought we could get to say yes, but but they were saying no because they didn't think we were valuable enough. Right. And so we did basically what this guy, you know, 165 bucks a year um, did because it was just our gut. It was what yeah. we were comfortable with at the at the time. But we then adjusted and adjusted and adjusted as we were seeing where we felt. And I don't have any idea if this was the right approach or not it's just what we did we ended up moving what we originally priced around eight eight to ten thousand dollars to thirty thousand mm dollars and we found that it was the the sweet spot for a earning what you know, far more than we were expecting we could earn and b getting the buy-in from the client we wanted to get and so we stopped there because we sort of felt like that was the right place. Now, it's very possible at the time that we continued to leave a lot of money on the table, mm -hmm. but I have no idea how I would have measured that at that point. Well, uh, it's, I mean, first of all, uh, your price sets an expectation of the quality and benefit of, of whatever you're selling. So if you underprice yourself, people don't think it's going to be any good. But it also sets an expectation of the 
of the 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 actual result and benefits and and uh, again for illustration here and this has been done many times in in academia um it has been found that your uh, your your um five cent aspirin is mm -hmm. not very good in curing your headache whereas a 50 cent aspirin is right sure and and just i, I mentioned a little bit that i'm um, leaning into the 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 audiophile industry you know and uh, and there are people out there that buy an audiophile grade um usb cable three mm -hmm. feet usb cable for <clears throat> um for three and a half thousand bucks right mm -hmm. um okay. if you know anything about digital stuff is yep. that it goes in one way in a cable it comes out the other way and it's unchanged yep. it either comes out or it doesn't come out at all right um but people spending those monies they clearly hear a difference because they expect to hear a difference mm -hmm. because they expect expect all that that uh that um you know they spend so much money on it and because of that they expect a certain benefit and therefore they get a certain benefit right so they are happy customers sure and 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 in your case just as when you increased your prices to 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 thirty thousand for your services, the company is more vested into um, into actually following your recommendations because they spent more money, right? Meaning that um, it it is more likely that the outcome for them is is going to be um, uh, it's going to be better than if they bought something at uh, at 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 a, at a very low price, and we know that. I mean, how? how how many, how many times have you? I, I mean, I've I've done this mistake too. You know, um, you you kind of you give something away, mm -hmm. right? And then you then you check with the the, the that potential prospect um, two weeks later, and you say, "What do you think about it?" And they say, "Oh, I don't know. I didn't use it." Right. <laughs> you know. Well, this this is very much the point that that we discovered, and I, I, you know, I probably knew this before we went into this experiment of, of playing around with the prices. But we ask a lot of our clients at uh, going through that process to participate and be mm -hmm. compliant going through, you know, all of the work that we're doing together with them, and mm -hmm. and giving them a lot of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. When we charge less, we would have people who would cancel or not show up for meetings or wouldn't do their, you know, homework, yep. uh, uh, you know, the preparation for the next meeting, et cetera. But when we're charging more, they are fully compliant and fully on board with us. And, yep. and I think it, it's the very same point that you've just made about giving yeah. something away. And, 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 and I, I mean, I, I have a very similar experience in, 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 in my business. Mm -hmm. Um, a few years because so so we do this uh what we do in my business is that we do willingness to pay research it, these are um often complicated um large projects where we go out in the marketplace and we measure what people are willing to pay and we can segment that to tell our clients the <clears throat> um, well first of all it, it gives us the opportunity to um uh, to predict sales volume and revenue at different prices. Okay. But then we also segment this on, on a customer basis so we can tell our clients what customer profile would support higher prices than others, you know, what product features, functions support higher prices, what marketing messages and marketing channel support higher prices and sales methodologies and sales channels support higher prices. So in the end, we can deliver a very comprehensive whole go-to-market strategy to a company. So these are involved projects. But um, for um, a few years back, um, I decided, to be honest, that let's see if we can skin this cat a different way by simply um, uh, simplifying our offering and selling it at a lower price. Mm -hmm. And and um, what I found to my surprise was just that first of all, it wasn't any ex it, it sales cycle was the same. Yeah, right. The amount of questions was the same. Um, the closing rate was the same. Um, yeah, it took us less resource to do the actual project, uh, but then we also found that. Um, 
the it, people didn't implement our recommendations. Mm. <laughs> Okay, so you so you had a similar volume of of people taking you up on your offer, mm-hmm. um, and you were actually not bringing in as much money, and it wasn't actually accomplishing anything for the business. Not uh, not yeah. as much, at least. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, you know, it's 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 um, you know, you try different things in your business and. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, you kiss an og- ugly frog. You know. Now, I, I want to go back to, and I do want to get to the the main point that mm-hmm. I made at the beginning of our, our program about sure. how do you deal with shifting or changing your prices once you you have one price established and and you and you've decided to make a change. But before we get there, um, you talked about all of the things that are you know, part of this comprehensive research and and the reporting Mm -hmm. that you'll then do for a client. And as I was listening to that, it, it opened up the idea that there's a lot, it's not, it's not more complicated, but it's more comprehensive, uh, an opportunity for a business because you, you talked about, um, the best channels, the best messaging, Mm -hmm. the, the right fit client for a certain pricing. And that then might suggest that there's multiple ways to sell the same thing to different people. And until you take the time to approach the, the, the research and figure all of this out, there's probably a lot that most businesses are not considering or setting up in, in the proper way, positioning themselves in front of the right people with the right price and the right offer. Yeah. The, 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 um, so in, in, when I'm interviewed, I'm often, um, asked, you know, how did I get into this? And and uh, let me tell that story because I sure. think that 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 gives the audience uh, uh, some some uh, context here. And and um, I had the opportunity to 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 run a couple of businesses in Europe and and then uh, several businesses here in the U.S. Once I moved here in the mid '90s, and we did experiments with pricing. Some of those experiments were very successful, meaning that next quarter revenues are up 25 30 percent. Others were real duds. And um, what I had learned in business school uh, was so academic and theoretical that it didn't help us in any way to understand why some experiments worked and others didn't. So 15 years ago, I decided I was too old and too opinionated to be a hired gun. So I set up my own shop and I decided to um, develop a process to make every pricing experiment a success. And that process is just what you mentioned, David. It's the it's the understanding not only of what people are willing to pay, but how different uh, customer categories have differences in willingness to pay. How mm-hmm. how um, how 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 different uh, product or service features and benefit leads to differences in willingness to pay. And you know the same with marketing channels and messages and sales channels and so forth. So. And it's it's by taking that holistic view, which is much more than pricing, because pricing is not a number. Yeah. Pricing is, in fact, a business strategy. And um, I have clients um, that really um, taken um, uh, pricing and made it a, a center point in their business strategy. And those clients... You know, those clients have grown to eight to 10 to 12 times their size in a few years' time, right? Yes. It it, it makes total sense. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we'll often talk about is you don't want to be the low price leader, as you you pointed out, right? Um, There's then there's everybody who is competing, looking at what every everybody else in the industry is charging. Yep. And so we talk about, well, you don't want to be one of them either. So how do you distinguish yourself? Well, you use pricing to be a premium or a luxury option, and then you build your offer around that. And it sounds like that's the area that you're 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 focusing on. Um not not exactly, but it's it's the um, it's the understanding of how um, how you it's the understanding of how you can differentiate yourself. Now, pricing also and uh, pricing also is is select your customers. Sure. 
you know? And, and let me just give you another example of this, a SaaS company we worked for a few years back. Um, we told them they, they were so underpriced that they could um, um, they, they could quadruple their prices. And which they did, not overnight, but over about a, a nine month period. And, and after checking in with the CEO, I, you know, he said, well, our sales volume went up 25%. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, uh, and I'm using the term that he, he mentioned, he said, and we got rid of the bottom feeders. We now yeah. have a more professional level of customers. So our customer support cost is down with 80%. Wow. So, so not only is there an increase in the volume, mm -hmm. increase in the, in the, in the uh, uh, revenue generated per customer, but the costs are also reduced. Yeah. Right. So yep. it is, I, I was going to say, you know, it's a, it's a marketing strategy, but you, you use the term business strategy and I think it is. It, it is absolutely. And, and, and um, uh, you know, for, for my new book that is also called the price whisper and, and, um, and there's a subtitle here, which is important. Actually, the subtitle is more important. And um, and the, the subtitle is a, hol a holistic approach to pricing power. And it's when you take that holistic approach, and I, uh, you know, like I said, I have um, endorsement from people we worked with who said, well, you helped us to grow 10 times the size, mm. you know? That doesn't happen overnight, of course, but um, it it is because once you understand how pricing influenced everything you do in your company, suddenly many small decisions are different. Sure. Right. So. All right. I, I, we want to tell people how they can get a hold yeah. of this book, but I've teased this uh, this one thing long enough that I think I, yeah, I, I want to hear that. your your uh, abbreviated answer to the question: How do you deal with changing a price? Both, I guess, internally we've sort of talked about it. How do you make the decisions about what the prices are, uh, or or have the opportunity to be? But how do you do it publicly? Well, um, first of all, the 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 um... Prices should always be set based on what customers are willing to, willing to pay, right? And and um, when when I um, obviously that's what we do in my company, and many small companies can't afford our services. So so um, what I'm telling them is is the following. I said, I tell them, go out and fi find twenty five potential customers. These are not your current customers. Mm -hmm. They are not your prospects. They are certainly not friends and family, but 25 new people, right? That could be your customers. Describe your service or your product and then ask them two questions. And the phraseology here is actually really important. Um, you ask them, what would what is the price now when you know this product or service? that is so low, you probably don't want to buy it because you think that it's not going to be good enough, that we will overprice, over promise and over deliver. Mm -hmm. And then you ask the next question, let's look at the flip side, that we're going to over deliver and the product or service is going to be better than you think it is. But what is a price that is just a bit too high so you won't buy it how good it ever is, right? When you have those 25 answers for either side of that, you you take yeah. the average and you have the range where your price should be. Interesting. You know, yeah. not below that and not above that. And then, of course, you set the price on the high end, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're in a company and can't find 25 people to talk to, you have bigger problems than prices. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, so this is one thing. Um, but if we go to in decreasing prices, you can do any die. That, yeah. Obviously, there's no point. There's no um, problem with that. Increasing pricing is a different story, um, and, and and especially if we're talking increasing prices when you haven't increased prices in a long time, right? First of all, any any company should teach their clients on the annual price increase. They should be 
two, three percent, you know, nobody will ever notice. Right. Um, and as you as you do this, it doesn't make a big difference. The first year you do it, it makes a huge difference after three or five years, you know, because uh, it's compound, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, but there's two challenges when it comes to price increases. First, again, like I said, it has to be made based on what your customers are willing to pay, right? That's the first thing. Um, and then you have to message this both internally and externally. Yeah. Internally, you often have salespeople and often marketing people that says, no, if you increase the price with even 1%, I'm going to lose all my customers. No, that's not the case at all. You have to... If you've done it right and you you've done you understand your differentiators, you you set up training programs for the internal people that that says this is what what customers are actually willing to pay versus what you think, right? And and this is what they actually see as valuable differentiators versus the stuff they tell you in sales negotiations, right? Because yep. you know buyer liar, right? Um, and and so so you 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 take that and you teach these people how to defend prices, right? And how you control a conversation, um, a sales conversation. You do that by asking questions. First, let the customer steam away, you know, and then start asking questions. Why is this such a big deal for you, right? Now our product our product only amounts to to two and a half percent of your product cost. How can how can our five percent increase in pricing be a big deal? Yeah. And and they're gonna say, well, you're probably right. <laughs> right. And and um so you set up training so so your training your staff can defend your prices. Mm -hmm. Um then you also have internal procedures for to grandfather people in who are um complaining too much, you know. Um, and you say, well, okay, you can have our old price for the next six months, but then we're going to increase it to the new price, right? And uh, and some of them are going to go away, and just like that SaaS company, they're probably happy that those some of those people go away. Oh, I spoke to a yeah. I spoke to a company Monday, I think, saying that we are pruning our customers, we are increasing mm -hmm. pricing to prune our customers because I don't want to deal with these guys, you know. Yeah. Um, now, inter externally, you also do, you, you don't do what the Netflix of the world do, you know, change prices without saying anything, you know? Sure. Well, you, I do, I do get a, uh, an email in a month in advance saying on your next, you know, next, uh, payment is going to be this, this much more. Well, that may be because <laughs> I had conversations with, uh, what's his name? Reed something, you know, because mm -hmm. they, they didn't used to do that. Yeah. They just had lots of angry customers who saw that on their on their uh, credit card bill suddenly the price was increased, mm. right? So um, so the 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 you, you message to your customers that yes we haven't increased our prices for seven years and we have absorbed the cost but we cannot continue mm. to absorb the cost so therefore we need to pass some of it. That's the key. Some That's true, yeah. of it on to 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 you, our customer, right? And if um uh, and you also need to use that. This is this is an opportunity to sell your service again. This is an opportunity to remind the customer of the value that you deliver. So it's Great. not going to yeah. be we are going to increase the price because because you know we haven't done it in a long time. Mm -hmm. It should be done in a sales letter or a sales communication kind of way. So re reinforcing the relationship and the value yeah. that you're bringing. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And specifically those differentiators, right? Uh, oh, no, I, I love that. It, there, uh, I, I know that there's more. And mm -hmm. and I want to and oh, I want to give and, yeah. and and I want to <laughs> give people a reason to go grab a copy of your book, which I know um, was just uh, made live on on Amazon at the beginning yeah. of November 2022. Mm -hmm. And so we want to um, encourage folks to to go grab that as well uh, and and check out what um, I'm going to totally butcher his name, but Jim Minarik 
had to say about the uh, the impact that you had on on his business um, as well. So uh, we can send people over to uh, your website where they can learn more about the book. Um, they can either attempt to spell your last name or more easily they can find uh, you over at pricewhisperer.me. Yeah. And uh, or, where, where or can just, they get a little bit more detail about the book there? Yeah, or or just Google uh, the Price Whisperer. Perfect. Um, I show uh, the Price Whisperer leads to the book. It leads to my company. It leads to me. Um, it, it also leads to service that Redfin used to have called the Price Whisperer uh, that they closed down five years ago or something like that. But um, so if it's real estate related stuff that you wander into, you're in the wrong place. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Well, the service is not longer available. So, <laughs> but <clears throat> but uh, that's the easiest. Google is is my friend. So, excellent. Well, Pear, thank you so very much for spending time with us explaining how important pricing is in businesses and how most businesses are overlooking it, but there's such an upside in, in, by way of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, grabbing a copy and, and digging into the book myself. Thank you so much, uh, David, for having me on the show. And it, it's been a pleasure. Indeed. Folks, if you enjoyed the conversation that you've just heard and know somebody who can also benefit from hearing it, please, by all means, pass it along. In the meantime, my name is David Baer. This has been More Perfect Marketing. Look forward to seeing you back here again real soon. Take care.